You're 18, you're at LSU College, you're on KFWP, now what happens? That became a big deal. Yes, at imagine Los, that. At Los Angeles City College, I was 17, 18 years old. Yes. And I discovered what I was best at. Mm -hmm. Not being a newscaster, not being a DJ, not being a weatherman, not being a camera person, not being a salesperson at a radio station. Um, what I was good at talking to people. was asking people questions. Yes, you and I'm still darn good at that. Yes, you are. Now, a question. Yes. Maybe unknowable. Elliot, you were propelled by this extraordinary event and opportunity. Had this opportunity not happened to you, would you, would your natural ability, which is great, been fortified as it was by the event? In other words, if, it, if the event had not happened, do you think that you would uh, have pursued with the same degree of conviction the, the career you chose initially? Yes. Okay. When I was uh, 14, 15, and 16 in New York, mm -hmm. and just exploring Greenwich Village mm -hmm. and getting around and learning how to ride the subway. Mm -hmm. I never said this publicly before. I carried this little rinky-dinky Radio Shack tape recorder mm -hmm. and I would talk to people on the subway. And I would interview the cab driver who was taking me home. Just a hobby of mine. I'm intrinsically curious Deep about curious. other people's lives. Deep. I know everything I need to know about Elliot Mintz. I got that story down. When I'm talking, I'm not learning. So other people's lives, what they're thinking and what they're feeling, that's my passion. It's my passion in life, and I move that over to broadcasting as well. There is no one who doesn't have an inner story that fascinates me, including you. And knowing you as I do, knowing how many famous people you know and how many consider you a famous person, you are equally fascinated. We've been to dinner before. You're as fascinated by the, the busboy as you are by the A-list Hollywood celebrity. Okay, so now you discover 1819, propelled by this extraordinary incident that you are good at talking to people and you're, you realize what you're destined to do. And so, how do you pursue your career early on? Um, I started writing letters, handwritten letters, this is before emails, fax machines. Mm -hmm real letters to movie stars. Mm -hmm. I lived in Hollywood. There you go. And I wrote to movie stars and asked them if I could interview them for the school radio show. Mm -hmm. I went down a Sunset Boulevard where there was a guy on the corner who sold the maps to the stars homes. Got the addresses. Three bucks. There you go. I got Which, the way, it was a lot of money at the time. I, I, I really had to conserve. That's breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Well, I only have one. Yeah. And I got the home addresses of movie stores. And I wrote to movie stores every night. You know, hi, my name is Elliot Mintz, and I'm 18, and I'm at LA City College, and we have a school radio show, and I would like to interview you. And I would send them out and say a prayer to the gods. So, here we are. Jack Lemon calls you on the phone. You're 18 years old, and what happens next? So Mr. Lemon says... Look, I'm doing a movie here at Columbia called Under the Yum Yum Tree. And um, I received your very respectful letter. And if you'd like, uh, I take a lunch break at around 11.30 or 12. It's about 45 minutes. And if you'd like to come over to the studio, I'd be happy to talk with you. Off you go. And where does that interview air? 
right on the school radio station. Radio station. Okay, so now, after you graduate school, how does this become a career for you? Well, uh, going backwards a second, the second person who called me was Jane Mansfield. The third person who called me was Richard Chamberlain. And within a very short period of time, I was known at L.A. City College and at my school radio station as the interview guy, mm -hmm. as the movie star guy. There you go. I only stayed there for another um, six months or a year, and I applied for a job. And at 21, I got my first job on radio station KPFK. And that is a station that still exists? Absolutely. Matter of fact, what is KPFK? KPFK is a station that's part of a group called the Pacifica Foundation. They have stations in New York and Los Angeles and Berkeley, Texas, etc. They are listener-supported stations, which means if people like it, they mail them a check, and that's how they survive. They don't sell commercials. And KPFK... Gave you a job. At 21, and I became the youngest uh, telephone talk show host in America. And this was, a, this was a, a talk radio show. Correct. In Los Angeles, and this is about 1964 or five? Five or six. Do you remember your first album? Oh, gosh. Um, $50, $60 a week. Okay. I think it was on three nights a week show called Looking In, and I would sit down, I would say, hi, my name is Elliot Mintz, I'm 22 years old, or whatever it is, and I'm here. This was a nighttime show, an overnight show. It was late at night. Mm -hmm. And who were some of the guests you had on? Tell us about it. Mm. It was the young rock and roll people of the time, it was the Frank Zappas, and the musicians, it was the, some of the local politicos, it was people like Mort Saul. Did was, you book the show as well as... Oh, yeah. And you did everything. Who, who had a producer, you know? I'd call people and say, I'm on a radio station that's heard clearly from San Diego to Santa Barbara. We have no commercials. I am not interested in confrontation. I am curious. I just want to give you a forum to talk about the things you believe in. Hundreds came. So you stay there for a, two two years. Two years, and then what happens? I got a job from a commercial radio station. What was that station? K L A C. Okay, which it, does not exist anymore. Thank does it? It does in a slightly different incarnation. And that was as a talk show host. They said, well, we heard what you're doing on KPFK, and we could use some younger listeners and a younger demographic, and maybe you're the guy. So if you want to, we'll pay you $300 a week wow. to be on our air for four or five nights a week. Good it was you. time to move on. Yes, it was. I left that apartment near Western Avenue and Hollywood Boulevard, not far from Charles Bukowski. To move to? Um, Vista Del Mar and Franklin Avenue, a little closer to Hollywood Vine, where I actually, my first apartment just had the Murphy bed in one room, a hot plate, and a mini fridge in a, uh, a room, to quote Heine Youngman, where the Ceilings were so low, the cockroaches were round-shouldered. <laughs> the room was so small that you had to step out into the hallway to change your mind. <laughs> I won't go further with it. Right. And I moved into a place that actually had a bedroom and a little kitchen. This is, this is high living. I was almost ready to get a car. Yes, yes. Oh, by the way, you're doing this in Los Angeles initially all without a car. Yeah, there was a bus. Wow. I went to school by bus. I went to interview Jack Lemmon. Went to interview Jane Mansfield at her mansion on Sunset and was very conscious of, gosh, if this interview goes any longer, I'm going to miss the last bus back into Hollywood. Yes. yes. Okay, so now we, you get your first commercial job, then what happens? It continues. Um, other radio stations call me, and I start... You know, radio people were a gypsy band. When do you transition? Do you do some television at this point? Not yet. I was still getting my feet wet. Mm -hmm. 
And it was also uh, the birth of underground FM radio. Mm-hmm. Now we're at about 1966 or 7. I'm so bad with numbers, but yeah, we're moving towards the end of the 60s. And it is the youth revolution. Yes, tumultuous times in Los Angeles and... The- Around the world. Mm-hmm. Transition of the music. Mm-hmm. By now, the Beatles, Bob Dylan, all of them had made their mark. Yes. That was the music that America's youth, youth was listening to. And then you, do, you, you then segue into television. Yes. Because- I did a little local TV show called Head Shop. Headshot. Headshot was the name of it. I did, I think, a hundred episodes of it. It preceded MTV by 20 years, where I would interview... What station was that on? It was heard locally on the Kaiser Broadcasting Network on KBSC, mm-hmm. and briefly syndicated to some other cities. And who were some of the guests on that? Well, the, the one that uh, I'll never forget is it was the first television appearance of a local lounge singer Mm -hmm. who just showed up and asked if he could do the show. And he played piano and played a song called Piano Man. Wow. And that was Billy Joel. The first time he had been on television. Mm -hmm. And they came. They came because there was no place else for them to go. There were no other television shows that had a rock and roll sensibility to them. So it was Cass Elliot, it was David Cassidy, it was uh, I mean, a hundred others who wanted to have an opportunity to talk, to be interviewed, and to, uh, to perform as well. Okay, so now we're getting into the late 60s. You're having, your career is going along very well. You segue from radio into television. I got a job for uh, on KABC Radio, which was the number one talk show in L.A. The iconic talk radio station in Los Angeles. Five nights a week. And while I was there, I was doing Eyewitness News on Channel 7. Blue Blazer, Circle 7, Puff Your Hair, Film at 11. And it was the birth of uh, Happy Talk uh, News. Did that for a while. Mm-hmm. Dick Clark called and asked if I would want to try doing a network show called In Concert that he was producing. Uh, a music show, I think, Friday or Saturday nights. Did a few of those. By this time, you have a call. Yeah, I had a car by then. Good for you. A small car, but okay. I, I never... Never wasted the money, and there weren't a whole lot of things I wanted to do with the money. 